Good morning and thank you all for coming. Uh, and thank you to all of the people who make history camp so wonderful every year. This is my fifth history camp. So I'm going to talk with you about Catherine Gibbs. Stand above the crowd and excellence in all you do were two taglines used by Gibbs in the 20th century. Uh, and the legacy of Gibbs exists in its graduates, in the people who know about it, and the people who believe that excellence in all you do is the way uh, to live. Now, my book is called Catherine Gibbs Beyond White Gloves because white gloves and Gibbs were synonymous for so many years. The public immediately recognized Gibbs students, and it was not because uh, the Gibbs students were wearing hats and gloves necessarily. For example, in the late uh, 1980s, President of Gibbs invited people from each school to come to the New York office to meet the corporate bigwigs. And she took them out to lunch. And someone on the street was heard saying, oh, they must be Gibbs girls. <laughs> no hats, no gloves, but what they did was they looked professional and they looked really, really confident. And that is exactly what Gibbs taught. Now, unfortunately, the white glove thing reduces really competent people to an article of clothing. So I'm going to take off my gloves because we're going to go beyond white gloves. Uh, what Gibbs graduates learned to do was produce quality work on demand every single day. No excuses. No missing deadlines. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Catherine Gibbs. She was born in 1863, right in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, and most people think that she was born in this area. She was actually born in Galena, Illinois, three miles from the banks of the Mississippi. And when she was 46 years old, she was widowed. She, her husband had died intestate. Uh, she had no income, only a high school diploma. And what she did was she built a world-renowned institution just with those, uh, with her qualities. Um, she created an educational institution that was really known worldwide. On eBay, uh, within the last few years, there was a Dutch uh, school that was selling a copy of its catalog, or someone was selling it. And it was described as the Dutch Catherine Gibbs. That's really how important her school uh, became. Sorry, you're going to have to put up with this. Um, the Gibbs family motto was hold to your purpose. And that's exactly what Catherine Gibbs did. That was the mantra of her life and of everyone associated with the institution. She was an entrepreneur back when that word wasn't used uh, for women at all. She educated them for business when they were not welcome. Uh, when she opened her school in 1911, women could be uh, domestic workers or they could work in the factories. And that was just about it, uh, the number of professionally educated women was absolutely minuscule. Uh, and if they did get a job in an office, they were called typewriters after the machines they used. They weren't allowed to be secretaries because at that point, men were secretaries. They were allowed to be typewriters named after their machines. She also created her school in 1911, uh, two years after her husband died, uh, in a hostile, in a world that was really hostile to business. Um, a Harvard Medical School doctor who lived on Arlington Street wrote a book that said higher education may cause the uterus to atrophy. <laughs> yes, I always have to wait for the laughs. It went through 11 printings. People really believed that higher education was bad for women. So in spite of all of this, Catherine Gibbs succeeded. Why did she succeed? Because she had character. She was a paragon of excellence, of graciousness, and really hard work. 
Uh, when I began teaching at the Boston School in the 1970s, everyone still referred to her as Mrs. Gibbs, although she had died in 1934. Uh, and at one point at a board meeting when I was working on this book, someone said to me, oh, did you know Mrs. Gibbs? I don't know how old they thought I was, but no, I did not know Mrs. Gibbs. But her legacy lives on in her graduates, who include business executives, business owners, lawyers, writers, college and university faculty, artists, public figures, creative directors, even a US ambassador, a judge, and a college president. Not bad for a woman who started uh, her school because she simply needed to feed her children. One of the things that I think is important to remember is that when Catherine Gibbs' husband died in 1909, she didn't have the right to become the guardian of her children. Uh, she was, in fact, uh, she had to go to the courts and ask to become their guardian. The sheriff showed up to ask the boys whether or not they wanted their mother as guardian. It was a completely different world. So how did this amazing woman become the CEO of three schools by 1918? Providence, Boston, and New York. Two years before women had the vote, she had three schools. Part of this comes from her character, which comes from the way she was brought up. So I need to tell you a little bit about her uh, family. Uh, the early history of the uh, Ryans. By the way, her name was, her birth name was Catherine Ryan. And the Ryans, when they arrived in the United States, did not stay on the East Coast because it's not a it was not a comfortable place for the Irish to be. Uh, they went to Kentucky and Ohio and Missouri before finally settling in Galena. And what they did in Galena was really clever. They set up a wholesale business in groceries, and they sold food to people who were going across the Mississippi to homestead. No one would ever come back with complaints, uh, but even more to the point, they were very honest folks. Now, uh, when Catherine was born in uh, 1863, she was baptized Catherine, C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E. Not that spelling. She was also known as Katie in the 1980s census. She was known as Kate at her high school. She was known as Kitty at one point. Um, she was in charge of just who she would be and how people would refer to her. Now, her father uh, was one of two sons of the immigrant uh, Ryan, and he was a leading a uh, citizen in Galena. I mean, really leading. He was on the bank of, he was on the board of the bank, the railroad, the turnpike company. He made a lot of money. He had a pork packing business uh, and slaughtered uh, thousands of pigs every day uh, and was very, very wealthy. So uh, in 1886, he built this house. Catherine Gibbs was 13 years old. That house would impress even a 13-year-old. It's 24 rooms above ground. We think that it was probably on 600 acres because that was the standard uh, parcel. Uh, it had a working farm. It had a lot of people working on the farm. Uh, and uh, one of the things that Frank, that Frank, excuse me, that James, uh, Ryan did was he built a turnpike because before he came along, uh, farmers had to get their produce to Galena to get it shipped to Chicago, but there weren't any roads. They had to use plank roads, which meant taking planks, putting them down in front of wagons, uh, and then picking some up and putting some more in. Very, very uh, time consuming and not really very effective. So what he did was he built a turnpike right in front of this house. He also put a toll booth in. 
very clever man. Um, and older citizens of Galena remembered the toll booth, and uh, the farmers were very happy uh, to have it. The Ryans were different from a lot of 19th century parents in that they believed their daughters should be educated as well as their sons. So they gave their daughters uh, some homeschooling for a while, and then uh, they sent them off to a high school uh, to be educated. Now, if you live in Illinois, which direction do you send your children? North. North? East. East. Actually, they send them northeast. northeast, to the northeast, because that's where the good education was. Uh, you lived in Illinois. OK, so you know Galena. OK. It is, it is a beautiful place. We'll see a picture of it uh, in uh, just a minute. Uh, they, uh, Ryan's sent uh, Catherine and her sister Mary to Manhattanville, which was then just north of 125th Street on Man in Manhattan in a village called Manhattanville. Uh, and it is now Manhattanville College in Purchase, New York. It is now co-ed. It is no longer a religious place. But it was at this at the point they were in school, they uh, were taught by the Madams of the Sacred Heart, and they had a very, very good classical uh, education. And this is Catherine Gibbs' uh, graduation picture. Uh, she is that one. Uh, she looks very much like the older Catherine Gibbs. But I think the thing that is really neat here is that uh, we have some of the archives. And the archives talk about what Catherine and her sister Mary were interested in, while the other girls in the class were spending money on um, clothes and ribbons and things like that. The Ryan sisters spent money on art lessons, on music lessons, on a really nice rug for their room. Uh, they were, in fact, very, very uh, conservative and very, very uh, concerned that they would have a good education, the best possible education. Uh, we were really lucky to have this because a few years after uh, Catherine Ryan graduated from Manhattanville in uh, 1882, the whole place burned down. And so we don't have any pictures of Mary, but we do have pictures of, we have this wonderful picture of Catherine. Now, you've seen that house. Do you think she ever expected to work? No, absolutely not. Uh, and she didn't until she absolutely had to. But when she uh, graduated, she spent some, she went back home. Uh, she and her sister would have parties. Uh, and they would have parties that would include uh, people from Manhattanville. Uh, and they would all be written up in the paper, just like society pages uh, of the 20th century. Um, now, here is something that is really interesting. At one point, she decided that she would go and visit her brothers in Montana. Now, they had gone to Montana to replicate, to Helena, Montana, to replicate their uh, grandfather's success in the wholesale grocery business. However, this time, they were selling to the gold miners in uh, Helena, Montana. She went to visit them and had a, a wonderful time, evidently, because she's in the census for two separate years. So she must have been having a good time. Well, one of the reasons she was having a good time is she was there, and she, uh, she met someone. She met William Gibbs. Now, William Gibbs is from Medford, or Method as we call it, Medford, Massachusetts. Uh, he was a jeweler. He lived in the same building with her brothers. In, he worked in the same building that her brothers lived in. He was on the ground floor, and they were upstairs. Uh, they began courting. Uh, now, there was one problem. William Gibbs's family goes back to the beginning of, uh, the, of the settlement of this uh, country. 
Uh, I've been able to trace it back to the early 1700s and cannot get back farther than that. Uh, however, he was Protestant. She was a serious Catholic. Had they been living close to their parents, this courtship never would have taken place, right? Uh, in the uh, late 19th century, it simply would not have taken place. Now, so they're having a good time in Helena. Uh, she is being called Kitty at this point. Um, she uh, learns of her father's death uh, in Galena, and he actually died in Dubuque, which is across the Mississippi. So when he died, what did the Galena to Chicago Railroad do? They put together a train to bring his body back. That's how important he was. Uh, he had the first telephone in Galena. He was an amazing, amazing person. So she went home uh, and uh, you know, spent some time with the family, but the courtship did continue. And they did finally marry in 1896 when William was 41 and she was 33. That's old for the 19th century. Uh, but they were uh, moved uh, from um, Helena to um, Providence, Rhode Island, where he became a jeweler. Of course, in the most upscale jewelry store in the whole city. Uh, but I think it is important to know that there is no record of this marriage, uh, because at this point, Catholic marriages were not recorded uh, in New York. Probably she was married in New York. Um, probably he was married in a Catholic ceremony. You know, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, oh, I know why she, I know she was married in New York, because the Galena newspaper had a slug, a very short piece that said, the friends of Miss Catherine Ryan, spelled the way she was uh, baptized, C-A-T-H-E, um, will be interested to know that she left on Saturday for New York City in order to be married. There will be more information forthcoming. <laughs> Believe me, I have been through the archives. There is no information. There is nothing. Uh, but she did marry, and she had two sons. Uh, the first, William Howard in 1897, and James Gordon in 1900. And both of these births took place in Providence, where, of course, they lived on a very posh uh, street. Um, William, as I said, worked at the best jewelry store in the whole city. Uh, and they moved out of the city proper to what would become Cranston, uh, right? And they lived right on the edge of uh, Narragansett Bay. There was a yacht club there, the Edgewood Yacht Club. He became the first uh, vice commodore of uh, the yacht club. And unfortunately, he was varnishing the um, mast to his yawl, and he fell and broke his head open. OK, now, first of all, this woman at this point is in her 40s, uh, and there is no income. Uh, the sheriff's men come to say, do you want your mother to be uh, your guardian? She has to pay for the ad to run that in the newspaper. Uh, she has no money on which to live. Uh, the money that she can uh, take from stocks that he owns and things like that, it comes down to uh, about an $18,000 uh, inheritance. However, she doesn't get the whole thing. She gets a third of it, and the, the boys each get a third. So here we have Catherine Gibbs living in uh, Rhode Island uh, on the edge of Narragansett Bay. Uh, we have her uh, not able to support herself. Now, there are lots of stories that are not supported by any documentation, that she took in some dressmaking, that she did some millinery. Somehow, the lady who came from that house does not strike me as someone who would put a sign in the window saying, dresses hemmed. She just wouldn't do it. I just don't think so. So 
We have her sister Mary, who was at Manhattanville with her two years ahead, uh, come east to help with uh, the boys. And the next time we hear about her in the public record is 1911, at which point she became the manager. Okay, this woman with no experience. She became the manager of the Boyd Syllabic Shorthand School, and she bought the school. Now, how she bought it, we don't know. Uh, the stories are that her neighbors, who were brown faculty and uh, people like the owner of Narragansett Brewery, lent her the money uh, to open it. Um, and most of the uh, images of Catherine Gibbs are as a woman who started a school for women. And it certainly did become that. But if you're trying to support your children, you'll take anyone, including men. Because men could get jobs. Women could not get jobs. Uh, so she opened her first, uh, she bought the school, which was failing. And it was in that building on the fourth floor uh, in downtown Providence that she started the Providence School for Secretaries. Uh, and boy, was she clever. She did things like um, advertise in the newspaper uh, that this was a good school for men and women to come to if they didn't want to be in those large commercial schools with just anyone. I mean, what she was doing was playing on people's snobbery. Um, in fact, she did have some serious uh, competition uh, from Bryant and Stratton, which was 50 years old when she began Gibbs, uh, and all over uh, the East Coast. They had a million dollar, um, seven story building in Providence. They were serious competition. Also, Miss, and it's now Bryant University, as you know. Uh, also, Miss Johnson and Miss Wales Private School of Shorthand. They had been educated at Millersville uh, University in Pennsylvania. They came east. They set up a shorthand school. And they were doing the same thing that Catherine Gibbs was doing. Uh, come to our school. We'll give you the best education possible. She just dismissed people as being uh, worthy of uh, anyone's uh, attention. Uh, she ha also made sure that she had money coming in. Uh, she and Mary were the only teachers for a long time. Uh, she had a correspondence school and advertised, well, are you someone who really doesn't have a grasp of how you should write? I will teach you. Come to my school. She also set up correspondence classes, which was very clever. Because if you have a correspondence class, you don't have to be away from the kids. You can take care of all of the stuff at night. Very clever. You all know Popular Mechanics Magazine, which was a 20th century standby. It, people read it, bought it, made the things that were in it. In the back of uh, one of them is an ad for a school that is in that building in exactly the same rooms that Catherine Gibbs has. And what it does, it's a correspondence school that says, we'll teach you to write a business letter. Send us your money, and by the fourth lesson, you'll know how to write a business letter. Really, really clever. Did not use her name, did not use the name of the Providence School for Secretaries, which was what it was called at this point. Uh, but she uh, kept bringing in money in order to support uh, her family. Um, I think that one of the things that is uh, really neat about Gibbs is that she knew she needed to have people from uh, higher education come and talk with her students. So there she is in Providence. Where does she go? She goes to Brown. And there is a wonderful story that is actually documented. Uh, there was one man who didn't want to teach for her. I mean, bunch of secretaries for Pete's sake. I don't want to teach them. Uh, and she walked into his office, um, evidently didn't make an appointment, uh, which is a no-no, and said, I understand that you're someone who can hold my students. 
and the two of them just started laughing. And he came and he, he taught at, uh, at Gibbs uh, in Providence. Um, she also told this man that she had a dream of invading Boston and New York. Now, I can say this because I am a Providence native. And if you are, you see Boston as the big time, and you see New York as almost out of sight. That's exactly how she felt. She had dreams of invading uh, Boston and New York. So she did. The first place she came was Boston in 1917. But as you all know, 1917 is when we entered the First World War. She applied for permission to sell some of Williams Railroad stock so she could put herself uh, in uh, business in Boston. Uh, but we entered the First World War. In 1917, there were three drafts. Guess what happened? She lost half of her students to the draft. So what did she do? She changed the advertising. It became then a school for educated women, as if that had been her idea all along. It wasn't. Uh, she began teaching uh, on Huntington Avenue, at 25 Huntington Avenue, right next to the uh, public library. But the interesting thing is that across the street, there was a Kate Ryan Dramatic School, which taught public speaking, and how to project, how to uh, make um, public presentations, how to make yourself up, not too much, of course, how to dress for them, and so forth. There's no evidence that this is our Kate Ryan, but I'll bet you it is, because that's the kind of thing that she would do. That's 1917. OK, the next thing she does is she moves to New York, to the Architects Building on Park Avenue. And I was giving this talk in Florida, and I said, from the Catherine Gibbs we know, she would never go to Flushing. <laughs> yes? Mrs. D, I grew up in Flushing. I said, right, would you put Catherine Gibbs School in Flushing? No, no, it's not where it belonged. It belonged on Park Avenue. Uh, and uh, she it had more typewriters than she had students, but she did succeed. By the 1920 census, she's living uh, in the high 50s, just a few steps from Fifth Avenue. By 1928, she incorporates the school. By 1930, she is living on Park Avenue herself. She and her sister, her two sons, three live-in servants, and the only black live-in servant in the building, uh, I have to say. And she was also making over a million dollars in today's money. That's 1930. 1911, she didn't have two pennies to rub together. Her marketing sense was infallible. Uh, her earliest um, catalogs looked like dance cards back in the uh, 19th century and in the, to the 50s. We wore dance cards uh, at formal dances. Um, and you were supposed to write down the people to whom you had promised dances. That's the way she made her uh, catalog look. Again, what she's doing is appealing to the parents, who, of course, are going to have to pay the money. Uh, she also, with that marketing sense of sell, which was just infallible, she also printed a list of places from which Catherine Gibbs School students uh, came. She printed the Seventh Sisters, uh, Milton Academy, Miss Porters. Of course, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of public high schools, but that wouldn't convince the parents to spend the money. So she printed the schools that would be the most impressive. Uh, she also uh, started the Gibsonian uh, and an alumni association to keep the graduates together and to spread the world word about Gibbs. And keeping the graduates together was very important because part of her, she during her lifetime, she always wrote for it and for the Gibsonian. And her message was, you went to the best school, you've got the best education, you're going to have the best career. Did she, at the beginning, have any evidence that was going to be the situation? No. 
but she went ahead. Now, I told you what happened, the kind of um, disruption that the First World War call, caused. Well, 1929, you have the stock market crash. And all of those people to whom she had been uh, pitching her woo were no longer available. So what did she do? She went out and she spent $8,000 on a marketing report. How do we get our students back? Now, it was really serious. Boston, for example, which had a residence, went from 120 students in 1930 to 50 in 1932. That was serious because resident students were worth three times as much as commuter students. So the final report from the marketing committee in 1933 gave her a way to produce 800 new enrollments in the next year. And she did it. But one of the things that I think is really important is that she said that she hoped at one point to train women managers. Because secretary means too many different things. People who are receptionists could call themselves secretaries. People who assist the CEO will call them, could call themselves at that point secretaries. Um, one of the things the plan says is that uh, Pub publicity is absolutely essential. And that dignity, not sensationalism, was the watchword. And that's why people would remember Gibbs. And they gave some rules. And I usually don't read, but I want to read this. All communications were to be positive. Negative impressions or mistaken ideas were not to be restated and denied, but were to be combated by positive assertions. Unfavorable truths would be were to be presented frankly and then dramatically, and all written material uh, was to be approved by one of the family. Wow. That's what crisis management says today. You don't deny stuff. You just assert something positive uh, and, and move on. And believe me, they needed to. They had one young woman who killed a newborn in 151 Commonwealth Avenue. Couldn't deny it, it happened. Um, so she had a lot uh, of work to do. She also always made sure that she was in beautiful buildings. Uh, I'm showing you the first building in uh, Boston, which is right next to the BPL, which is here. This had been a hotel, and she, was, she had two rooms there. If she... Uh, the Kate Ryan School that I think is hers, it would have been over here. Uh, in New York, that's the uh, architect's building on Park Avenue. Again, Park Avenue at that point, as now, did not allow any trucks. It was the only um, street that was free of trucks in the entire city. Publicity. Remember what I said about the marketing report? It said, you need to have publicity. So she got it. 1934, uh, those lovely women uh, on the cover of Time magazine are there for a, in New York, for a conference on business that was opened by uh, the First Lady and closed by the President. Uh, one of the people is from Bonnard, which was the Women's College at Columbia. Two are from uh, the upscale private schools that would send students to Gibbs. And one of them is, act is a publisher. And then one is actually uh, the dean of the New York school. Uh, 50 year, or a few years later, for the 50th anniversary, Business Week ran a uh, cover article about Gibbs. If you want to have people who can really help your business, send them to Katie Gibbs. Um, The interesting thing is that in all of the publications, whether it's Time or Business Week or Good Housekeeping or Saturday Evening Post or Cosmopolitan, wherever, the same language was used to describe Gibbs. Elite is one of them. Now, was it in fact elite? Hmm. Mrs. Gibbs, when she was alive, she wouldn't accept anyone who couldn't do the work who was going to just not make the grade. Uh, but you know, if you could make the grade, you were in. Um, 
We have also an article in Saturday Evening Post about how to educate a secretary. It was really about how to educate a secretary at Catherine Kids and nothing else. Uh, this, oops, sorry. Uh, this is 21 Marlboro Street uh, with students sitting on the steps. That usually outrageous gives people. What do you mean they were sitting on the steps? Uh, and this is a uh, an employer visiting 151 Commonwealth Avenue and talking about how he would hire uh, Gibbs uh, people. Uh, all right, now, we're really finished with the first um, section of Gibbs history, and it is just going to end terribly. Howard was the oldest son. Both sons served in the First World War. Uh, Howard was the oldest son, and he committed suicide by jumping out of his mother's apartment on Park Avenue. Um, now, this is 1934. In 1934, suicides who were Catholic could not be buried in Catholic cemeteries. Do you think that Catherine Gibbs stood for that? No. She went to St. Anne's Cemetery in Cranston, where her husband was buried, a Catholic cemetery, had him disinterred and had them both buried at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, which is a garden cemetery like Mount Auburn. It's a beautiful place. It's also where she is buried. Now, she was still a serious Catholic, but she wasn't going to have anyone say that her son couldn't be buried next to uh, his father. Um, Catherine Gibbs herself died two months later. And the second phase of Gibbs begins. The remaining son became president. What is he going to do? What he's going to do is very simply uh, carry on the tradition. He will continue with the name Catherine Gibbs because that's what has panache. That's what sells. Uh, he will, um, first of all, he had uh, a very important uh, portrait painter do three paintings of Mrs. Gibbs. One of them is on the cover. They were exactly the same, except in different pastel shades for the, the three schools. This painter painted people like Henry Ford, so leaders in business. When Gordon took over, he made a couple of changes. One was he got married. I can understand why you wouldn't get married with Catherine Gibbs around. Uh, I, I, mean, I really do. Uh, but he got married right away to a woman who had been his secretary, has been his mother's secretary, uh, was a Gibbs graduate. She had been registrar in Providence, and he and Blanche uh, had a wonderful life together. Now, everyone, or now, started a new paragraph. Everyone who goes to college thinks about a semester abroad or perhaps even a year abroad. In 1937, Gordon instituted a time abroad uh, in Bermuda. He had typewriters shipped on liners and brought to uh, the to Roseden. That's where the classes were held. Uh, the lower uh, picture is what Roseden looks like today. And over here, we have a picture of the students um, with their teacher. Notice they're all in professional clothing. That's because there's a teacher there. If you go to my website, you'll see a, uh, an album of pictures from Bermuda, including a woman wearing pants and smoking a cigarette on the beach. Now, this never would have passed muster when Catherine Gibbs was alive. Uh, however, um, it is, in fact, uh, the way that Gordon again, got more publicity for the school, but the war was coming, so he did have to stop that. However, you all, I've got the original, one of the originals downstairs from an Esquire magazine. Um, this, there was no Me Too movement. If women were mistreated, they just put up with it or called Catherine Gibbs and said, help, help because Catherine Gibbs School was seen as a place that actually gave women a sense of their own uh, worth. Um, now, during the uh, Second World War, 
uh, men, of course, were leaving, which meant there were a lot of jobs open. And if you needed a job, what you did was you signed up for a secretarial school, and in two weeks, you had a job. Now, did you know anything? No. Did you know how to file? Did you know how to send out correspondence? No. You didn't know any of that. It was so bad that businessmen in Chicago said, please come and open a Gibbs. And Gordon did that. It was a Gibbs in Chicago in 1943 and lasted until 1953. Um, again, in elegant buildings, uh, and Gordon said, his mother always said, have a few antiques scattered around. Yeah, we spend a lot of time now talking about if you need to have a good environment for students to learn. And she, her view was a few antiques would do it. Uh, photographs of student life were printed all over the place, all over the country. Uh, and that picture that I showed you of the Saturday Evening Post article, I was giving a talk at um, a local museum and a woman said, oh, my father saw that and said, you're going to this school. She came from California and was sent to Boston to go to school. And it was the best time she ever had. In the same audience was uh, Catherine Graham's personal secretary. And I said, you know where the bodies are buried, don't you? And she said, yes, and I'm not talking. Because the secretary keeps uh, secrets. OK, we are now at the point where we have two grown Gibbs daughters, and neither of them wants the, wants the job, so we the, wants to run the school. So we enter the third uh, portion of uh, Gibbs history, and that's when it is owned by uh, other companies. It was always a profit-making operation. They never apologized uh, for that. So. They looked around. They found Macmillan, the publishing company. Uh, and Macmillan added uh, not only programs like information processing and uh, travel and conference and um, hotel and restaurant management. They also added schools all the way down to the uh, Washington, D.C. area. And they spent a lot of money to upgrade uh, the facilities, which was just wonderful. Um, now. We have to talk about the end of things. Macmillan was doing very well uh, with Gibbs. And I worked for Macmillan. They were wonderful. They didn't interfere with my sending home people home because they weren't in dress code or giving them bad grades because they hadn't done the work. Uh, they didn't interfere with that at all. They just wanted their percentage, and they got it. Uh, but they were also, at this point, a standalone publishing company. And some of you may have heard of a man named Robert Maxwell, a British publisher who really wanted Macmillan. I mean, really wanted it. Uh, and he bought it. Uh, it was a hostile takeover. It was very nasty. Lots of lawsuits. This is 1989. And Robert Maxwell, who was the publisher of Pergamon Press in Britain, uh, said to the president of Gibbs, I will never sell Gibbs because I know of its brilliant reputation. Three months later, it was on the market because it was an asset that he could turn easily because he really had wanted Macmillan, and he paid much too much for it. So now we go into the final period where we have three corporations owning Gibbs until it was finally closed in 2011. Um, these are not, anyone here from Shreveport, Louisiana? I don't know anyone from Shreveport. But the first buyer came from Shreveport. It was a college, for-profit college that was headquartered in Shreveport. They knew the brilliant reputation. They had no idea what they were buying. Uh, and that one uh, stayed in business until 1994, when a bunch of Macmillan executives who had worked with Gibbs said, enough. And they went in and bought it. And they ran it for three years and tried to make a profit. The difficulty is that in the public mind, this was still Gibbs. And we got rid of the name Catherine Gibbs School in a lot of the places and turned it to Gibbs College, but it still didn't make any difference. Men were admitted again 
Uh, you had expanded curriculum, but it just didn't make any uh, difference. I want to show you just two of those beautiful buildings, 21 Marlboro Street and uh, on Park Avenue, uh, the Grand Central uh, building, and behind it, the Pan Am building, to which they moved in the 60s because, she was, because Gibbs was determined always to be in the latest place. Um, when I, I want, I will do this very, very quickly. This is a Gibsonian from the 60s, and you can see that's a very 60s haircut. Uh, we have uh, Boston there. Uh, we have Providence, we have Montclair, and here we have Manhattan with the Pan Am building in the back. There's actually a helicopter landing on the Pan Am building. Because remember, there used to be helicopters landing on the Pan Am building. And back when uh, Gordon was still around, he used to take students to uh, the Pan Am Copter Club. Um, but it is, in fact, a um, a world that is going away. I do want to tell you about these folks. Uh, famous faculty, Olga Semeroff Stokowski. Yes, she was married. She was Leopold Stokowski's first wife. Gloria Vanderbilt was his last. Uh, and she was born Gertie Hickenlooper in Galveston, <laughs> Texas. She was the first woman, American woman, admitted to the. Paris Conservatoire, uh, but she knew that as an American musician, she'd never make it. So she married a Russian, got the name Olga, and then uh, got the name Olga Samaroff. Uh, famous employers include people like Fiedler, uh, Richard Nixon, uh, but a lot of other people. In fact, Ted Kennedy's uh, secretary is a Gibbs graduate and still very much involved. We also have uh, Barbara Vieira, uh, Martin, uh, Vieira, uh, Meredith Vieira, who is a Gibbs graduate of Providence. And Barbara Walters is not a graduate, but is actually an employer of, uh, a Gibbs, of Gibbs people, many Gibbs people, uh, and has worked with Gibbs throughout the years. Um, so, the last company uh, to own the corporation was Career Education from Chicago. And they made the decision to sell in 2008. I was chair of the board. My reaction was, not on my watch, not selling the Boston School. So, a uh, board member went to the Globe, and we had an article in the Globe, and it was all wonderful, and nothing came of it. Uh, in fact, um, the... Um, the school did close in uh, 2011. Um, but before it closed, Rhode Island Monthly at the Millennium gave uh, reference to Catherine Gibbs, uh, a thousand years of heroes, jock, scoundrels, jocks, and Catherine Gibbs, <laughs> which makes me very happy. Um, and this is, I explained to you what that first um, catalog looked like, a dance card. This is a catalog from the 21st century. Uh, we have men in shirt sleeves teaching. Oh, no. We have men in the classroom. Yes, OK. We have a, a, a real, um, a very 21st century um, image, uh, the graphic. Want to finish with Catherine Gibbs' own words. The first one is about accomplishment. Uh, yeah, you have to know what you want, and then you can get it. Uh, but the second one is the best. Distinguish between those things which are best and those which are second best, and choose and hold fast to the best. That's the Catherine Gibbs style. And I hope you have learned something, and you have some questions in the time we have left. I will stop now. Yes. Alina. Yes. Was there some reason for that, or I think they're always looking for the main chance. 
Uh, the elder Ryan, in fact, owned land in Kentucky. Uh, he owned land. I mean, he was, he was, in fact, making money in each place. But moving to Galena was very wise, because Galena means lead. It was a town with lead uh, mines and very, very wealthy. Uh, there was, a at that point, a river from the Mississippi that was navigable. And so a lot of money came in uh, from the Mississippi. Uh, you know, they are always after the main chance, just as Catherine Gibbs was always looking out for, what do I do next to make money? Yes? Uh, one thing I read from when they came over through Pennsylvania, a lot of these came down the Great Road, and then went west, and they were given land grants here? I don't know whether James Ryan was one of those. And uh, they certainly weren't given land grants on the East Coast, but they could have been given grants uh, more inland. Yeah, yeah. Yes? I was struck by um, her understanding the power of networking and building an alumni network and clearly connecting with faculty at Brown and, and doing mm -hmm. that. Do you have a sense as a single woman how she socialized or how she connected with people? She had personal power. She was a very small woman. I mean, really small, the way that a 19th century woman would be. But she was really small. But the way that she connected with people was through personality. Um, you know, the things like, uh, you know, you're one who can handle my girls. Hmm. Uh, but also, she went to Columbia and had uh, Pulitzer Prize winning people teaching uh, literature. She had uh, award winners teaching history from Columbia. Uh, you know, she was just very good. She had uh, she had people skills, a good story. Uh, when Boston was filled with secretarial schools, Gibbs was the gold standard. And one point, someone went into her office and said, Mrs. Gibbs, they're all waiting for you to set your tuition so they can set theirs lower. And she drew herself up to her full height, which was not much, and said, they know what they're worth. We know what we're worth. <laughs> and this sense of hold to your purpose and excellence in all you do, it drove everything that she did. Uh, and Someone on a tour one time said, would you have liked to work for her? Not sure. <laughs> Not sure, because she really was a tough lady. She was very polite, but she would get what she wanted. Yes, Chris? Do you have any sense as to how she went about placing her graduates? Oh, yes. Yes. She spent a lot of money advertising the placement uh, services, hired college graduates to be her placement uh, representatives, uh, put ads in papers. The Des Moines paper has an ad, a uh, man who is the CEO of a company saying, I will hire any Gibbs graduate I can get. Uh, she also had uh, placement in all of the uh, campuses when she was alive. Um, and you could go back over and over and over again. Uh, also, one of the things she printed, not only did she print that list of schools that people came from, she also printed in the 30s a list of places where Gibbs students worked. It's a who's who of American business and is really worthwhile. That's, that's something you really need to see. Uh, yes, John. Um, I came in a, a little late, so I know if we talked about this at the beginning, but um, from my understanding, she had posted that by doing this, she would propel women also into higher echelons of, of mm -hmm. business. And then mm -hmm. it ended up, they just became, you know, like they would always serve the men who were there. So how, how did she, did she continue to try to push for that, or did she just finally say, OK, this is just, how much was, how disappointed was she? I don't think that disappointment was part of her nature. <laughs> it's just something she didn't do. She accepted what was. And uh, I, someone doing a radio interview 
from, with me, said, well, was she disappointed that when she got married, she had to stay home? No, that's what women were expected to do. Uh, Mrs. Gibbs and Gordon and the companies that owned it knew you look out for the main chance uh, all the time. Yes? No, it doesn't have a historic designation. It was run as a bed and breakfast, and they did stay there. Uh, it was spectacular. And no I have plaques no place. plaques, no, no. Uh, I've done work for the newspaper trying to uh, do this. Anyhow, thank you so much for. And I uh, do come to my, I do two tour, free tours of Gibbs in the Back Bay. You can sign up downstairs, uh, and the book is, of course, downstairs. So I think you'd enjoy that. OK. OK. You're welcome. Is Airbnb still open? No, it's not open. It's now a private residence, which is a little bit scary. OK, Jen. Let's see. A little bit about it. But I, I did put in where I could put it. Because I, I thought, I'm going to put it in there.